Well, good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to, lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful day. I know you could be at the beach or you could be doing any number of things, but it's great to have you here. Um, I hope that you find this afternoon really encouraging, uh, really exciting. I'm excited about it, and I hope that you are too. And uh, in a little while, um, we'll, we'll get into the document. If you've got a copy of that, that would be great to have handy. Um, if you've got it uh, on your phone or whatever, that would be good. I wonder how you think about our church, how you feel about our church. Um, we're a fairly small church, really, aren't we, in the scheme of things? Uh, we haven't got hundreds and hundreds of people turning up. We're part of a small town um, and, you know, in our country, although we live in a relatively safe culture, it's actually sometimes hard to be a Christian, isn't it, in this kind of, in our, in our day and age. Um, if we found it, find it difficult, imagine how difficult the people of the first century found it. Um, basically, everyone hated them. Um, the Jews hated them because they were um, heretics who were advocating a different God. The, the Romans hated them because their worldview didn't fit in with theirs at all. Um, and pretty much everyone was out to shut you up and keep you quiet. Um, in Matthew chapter 10, um, oh, does it work? Oh, hang on a minute, I'll turn it on. In Matthew chapter 10, um, Jesus chooses 12 men to be his closest disciples, to be his closest friends, um, to follow him around, um, to see the things that he does. And one of the first things that he does with these 12 people is he sends them out. And so he, sends them, he says to them in verses 6 and 7, Go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you've received, freely give. That's his message to them. He has given them um, hope and joy and eternal life, and he wants them to share that with others. It's going to be hard. He says, he says to them later on in verse 17, they're going to be handed over to local councils who will flog you in their synagogues, which sounds like fun. Um, on, on your account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. They're going to be arrested. Terrible things are going to happen to them. I bet they're really glad they signed up. Um, but in the midst of that... He's got some words of encouragement. So in verse 19, uh, he says, Do not worry about what you will say or how you will say it, because at that time you will be given what to say. For it is not going to be you who's speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. In other words, you go out, but you're not going out alone, because God is, because I'm going to be with you. I'm going to guide you, I'm going to strengthen you, protect you, and empower you. Uh, and it's something that we mustn't forget today. Um, today we are not um, trying to uh, tell God what to do. Um, in fact, we're coming before God uh, to bring our thoughts and our, our ideas to him. Uh, it's really important, no matter what we do, that everything we do is bathed in prayer, um, talking to God about what we're wanting to do. This is God's church. This is God's building. It's, uh, it's God's group of people. It's God's congregation. It's God's town. Um, and we are just here to do God's work, and he's going to work in and through us. We're servants in his harvest field. But he also, although, yes, it's God who does the work, he also says something else to them in verse 16, which is interesting. He says, as you go out, I'm sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. It's going to be hard. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves, which is a weird statement, isn't it? But I think what he's saying is this, that as you go out into the world, be shrewd, be wise, be clever, be thoughtful, be strategic. Um, what we're doing, trying to do today, as I said before, is not telling God what to do. What we're trying to do is to conform our will with his and with his desires. We're going to be um, thinking and praying and talking, using the brains that God has given us to be shrewd, to be wise. Um, we're not just going to do things because they've always been done. We're not going to do them because it will make us feel better or, or, or to look better to other people. Uh, we're going to try and use the resources God's given us um, in the best way possible uh, for his glory. But we've got to be careful as we do that because as we think and as we plan and talk, um, the second half of the statement is be innocent as doves. In other words, um, our lives and our actions, our relationships with each other must always match the message we proclaim. And so no amount of planning and ideas and strategies and 21-page documents um, are going to um, do any good if we don't live up to the things that we teach. 
all of our best laid plans must show themselves in love for God and for each other. And so today as we come to this strategy document, uh, I say I hope that you get your, you get your mind stretched a little bit um, and you, you might go, wow, this is really big and, and maybe too big for us. Um, but we go, we're actually going to come before God and ask him to work in us uh, and through us for his glory. So how about I pray um, and then we'll get going. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for our church. We thank you, first of all, for calling us into your family. Uh, what a privilege it is to be part of the family of God. Lord, I ask that you be with us as we meet today. Help uh, us to be wise and thoughtful. Help us to be shrewd, but help us also to be loving. We pray that no programs or ideas or thoughts would take the place of love for others. And so, Father, we ask that you would guide our discussions and our thoughts um, by your Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what are we going to do today? Let me tell you what we're going to be doing. There's three things I hope we're going to be able to do today. The first thing uh, is that I'm going to go through and outline the contents of this. So I'm not going to be speaking to everything because we'll be here all, all afternoon. But I'm going to, I want to go through and tell you, explain to you what it's all about and, and help you to understand some of the, uh, the highlights of it. Um, I'm going to try and do that in about 30 minutes, just under. So I'll hopefully finish at about 25 to, something like that. Um, and then after that, I'm going to open the floor to you, um, to, for you to ask questions, for you to, um, to discuss. We might actually spend some time breaking up and talking to each other. Uh, we might do that. But really, I want, to, I want to hear back from you, see if I can clarify and give you, help you understand, and maybe to get you to start thinking about how you can be involved in it. And the last thing I want to do is for us to pray. And so I'm going to, whatever happens at um, quarter past three, um, we'll stop and we're going to pray for 15 minutes. Okay? So I think it's really important for us to do that, um, to make sure that everything we do um, is surrounded in prayer. So let me see. Let me start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Um, this document, 21 pages, and has anyone read it? Had a chance to read it? Excellent. Thank you so much for that. It's so encouraging to hear that you've actually read it. Um, it's really great. Um, you may have, as you read it, you may have been a bit daunted, a bit overwhelmed. I've had at least one response saying something like that. Um, there's a lot of things in here. Um, one of the aims of this document is actually to try and help us to look at the things that we do or the things that we could do and see how they all fit together. There are a lot of churches uh, that kind of go through life and ministry without kind of thinking about what they do. They just, we've, we've done this because we've always done this. We always have church at 8 o'clock. Like why, you know, it seems obvious, um, but it's important for us, I think, to think through everything that we do, uh, why we do it, and how they fit together. And so when we come up with new ideas for things to do, we just try and think, well, are they duplicating things that are already being done, or maybe they, they, we could do things that we're already doing a, a bit better. So this, the document is actually divided into six parts, and the first part is about our mission and our values. And so this is something that um, has been part of our church for a long time, actually. This is not something that, that I've made up. This is something that uh, our mission has always been, um, knowing Jesus and making him known. And on our website, you've seen the values that you see there. Um, they talk about who we are. It's the motherhood and apple pie, if you like, kind of part of the document. Um, but we actually, it's tempting to kind of skip over it. But actually, it's probably the most important page of the document. Because in the end, it's that page, it's the information on there that guides everything else. Um, it's, if you like, the measuring stick or the yardstick for all that we do. And so when we think about the activities, different ministries we do, if they don't fit in with our, our goals and our values, then we shouldn't do them. When we're, when we're thinking about plans for the future, we should think, do they fit in with what we're trying to do as a church? What's important to us? And maybe if we're trying to decide between two things, we might go, well, which one is more effective at doing these things? Keeping up, upholding our values, keeping God's word as, as the ultimate authority, um, keeping the centrality of the cross and so on. These are things we actually, we actually need to keep coming back to this page. And so as we go through, and if, if I talk about things and you think, well, hang on a minute, that doesn't fit in with our values or our goals, then please say that. Because if we, if, if we decide to do things that really aren't fitting in with who we are, then uh, we shouldn't do them. So th that's a really important page. I don't want to spend too much time on it because I hope that you've just read it. Many of you will just read it and go, yes, I agree with that. It's all fantastic. And I hope you do because that talks about who we are as a church. 
It talks about our values. So before we move on to the next and kind of the meat of it, if you like, I want to ask you this question. What is our most important value? If you had to look at all the values that we have, what's the most important thing about being the, church, the, the people of God? Have a think about that for a moment. Anyone got any ideas? Or Les got his hand up. Uh, yep. Yeah. Love what? Who? Why? How? Yeah. The most important thing that we can do, the most important commandment um, is, we heard about last week, John spoke about it, was it last week? The week before John, two weeks ago. Um, the most important thing we can do is to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. Being a Christian is about loving God first and foremost. And that's why our first, uh, the first part of the document is about spiritual growth. Because if we are on about anything else, it, we are on about loving God. And if everything else fell away, this is the one thing that mustn't fall away. Because without it, we're just a, um, a community organisation, we're just a social group, we've got nothing to do with eternal life. And so our centre has always got to be um, on God. And so that's what spiritual growth is. It's, it's the centre of all that we do, the foundation of all that we do, our primary goal. Um, and God has given us some great things to be able to help us with that. He's given us his word. He's given us the Bible. He's given us the gift of prayer. And he's given us each other as a way of uh, growing in our knowledge of him, our love for God. And so we kind of saw there are two ways that we can grow in our love for God. One is in our personal faith and one is through our corporate faith, our, our corporate relationship. So each one of us is responsible for our own faith. I'm, I'm the minister of this church uh, the senior minister of this church, but in the end, each one of you is responsible for your own faith. I can't be responsible for you because I, I have no control over you. <laughs> That's so true. Um, <laughs> I have no control over you. In the end, your faith is between you and God. And so each one of us um, needs to take, take that responsibility um, for ourselves to work out how can we grow in our Christian walk. But of course, we're not Robinson Crusoe here. God, God hasn't called us to be on our own. He's actually called us to be together. And so that's what the corporate dimension is. And so as we think about our church and we think about the things that we do, um, they, a lot of them will help us to grow in, in either of those ways. And so one of the pages you'll find is this page, which is a beautiful diagram. Uh, what I've tried to do, the diagrams are there for those who, are, who love kind of pictorial ways of viewing things. Some of you will like the, the lists and some of you will like the pictorial views. I'm actually going to focus on the pictorial ones today because um, it helps us get an idea of how these things fit together. You, so you'll see there, in our, the whole thing of spiritual growth, we can grow personally at the top there or corporately. There are things that we can do on our own. There are things that we can do with others, essentially, is what we're talking about. Now, as we go through this document, there are going to be some things that are, we... Uh, some of the things we're already doing. And so this is, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're not starting from scratch. Our church has been going for many years quite well, thank you very much. Uh, and so we don't need to reinvent everything. Um, there are a couple of ideas of things that we could um, bring in, new things. And so when you go through the document, you'll find them highlighted in yellow. Um, just, just to highlight for them. Not because they're more important, but because we feel these are ways that we could actually, these are new things that we might choose to do. And these are not kind of fait accompli's. We're definitely going to do all these things straight away. There may be things that we'll, we'll bring in over time, uh, but they're, they're important things for us. So let me just highlight some of the things. The first one I want to highlight is... Whoop, oh, that's, wrong, that's the wrong button. Um, a prayer chain. One of the things that we want to do um, is to bring in a prayer chain. I don't know if you know what a prayer chain is, but it's a way that we can pray for each other and we can be prayed for. As It's a corporate... Um, structure, if you like. It's something that we do as a church together, but it's actually something that we do individually. And so let me say, for instance, Gary um, falls over and breaks his leg. Um, we hope that doesn't happen, um, especially before the um, AGM next week. But uh, if Gary falls over and breaks his leg, what do we do with that? Well, we might help him, we might um, support him, we'll think about that in pastoral care. But one of the things that we can do is we can be praying for him. And so a prayer chain is one of the ways that we can pray. How, how does... Um, Greg, know that Gary's broken his leg. How can Greg pray for him? Well, one of the ways he can do that is through something like a prayer chain. A prayer chain is basically we have one or two coordinators and we'll be looking for people to coordinate this ministry. Um, 
And so if when Gary breaks his leg, um, well, Brenda will ring up and say, Wendy, say it's Wendy. Wendy, Gary's breaking his leg. Could you please pray for him? He's going to the, hosp the hospital right now. Could you ask people to pray for him? Wendy then will then communicate with the prayer chain. So it might be um, that she, she shares it through an SMS message. Please pray for Gary. And it's gone. She can send a bulk message straight at once. Or she might send an email. Or she might ring someone. She might ring Loris because Loris hasn't got a computer. Um, and... She would be totally offended if we left her out of this. Um, and so she might ring Loris, and Loris would go, thank you very much, I'll pray for that. And then I'm going to ring uh, Cecily, who also doesn't have a... Well, she does have a computer, but pretend she doesn't. Um, and she says, I'm going to ring Cecily, and Cecily will... And she'll say, please pray for Gary. And then Cecily will ring Gay, who will ring whoever, and so on. You see what I mean? So it's a chain. It's a way that we can pray for one another. It's a corporate structure, if you like, for want of a better word, uh, but it's something that we can do for our, it's our own faith between God. So as Loris prays, she, she's bringing um, Gary to God. Um, one of the other things we, we're considering doing is, is bringing in the whole idea of mentors. One of the great blessings of each of our services, actually, is that we have people from a, a number of different demographics, um, people from different age groups. Some people have been Christians for 50 years and more. Some people who have been Christians only for five minutes. Um, and so one of the things that we can do is to help each other grow. And so the idea of having a mentor, someone who can support you as you grow in your Christian faith, is something we're looking at doing. Obviously, how we do that, we'll have to think about, but this is just an idea that we're thinking about doing. Um, one of the things we need to do is in our services, we need to make our services uh, well, we already have sermons, we hope, and music that helps lift, lift us up in prayer. Uh, but also, uh, we can do things like sharing testimonies. We can share with each other, you know, how do, how do you read your Bible? Because sometimes people find it hard to read the Bible. Do you ever find that? Reading the Bible or praying? Some people find it hard. Some people think it's the most natural thing in the world. They don't struggle with it at all. But we can help each other by saying, well, you know, how does Joe read the Bible? What's one way that she, she does that, to help her? Maybe that would help me. So through our services, we can help each other. Um, we can have one of the ideas is to have an event, um, a termly prayer and praise night. One of the things we had on Saturday was our monthly prayer gathering, which was fantastic. Uh, and we had a good number of people turning up, but they're all older than me. No, actually, except for one. It's Lorna with you. Um, they were all, all, all older. Why, why, why don't we get our younger people coming to pray? Well, maybe it's because it's 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. <laughs> uh, maybe that's one of the reasons. And so one of the things we thought we might do is to bring in a termly um, prayer day where we, perhaps we, we cancel all our Bible studies for the week and we all come together. Maybe some people will come in the morning, so we might have a morning gathering and we might have an evening gathering so that people who are at work, for instance, could actually come and pray. Um, and so it's, it's an opportunity for us to actually spend time with our God, but we can do that together. Um, so, yeah, so there's, there's all sorts of other things that we're already doing things like the services and the Bible study groups. Bible study groups, of course, are key in this. It's a way that we, we can grow in our knowledge of God. But the most important thing we can do is grow in our love for God. That's the key thing. The second thing, I'm going to just go through much quicker, I'm sorry, is the second most important thing we can do is to love each other, to love others. Love God and love others, um, as Les mentioned earlier. And so we can love others who are Christians and we can love others who are not Christians. And so actually the next two sections of the, of the document talk about how we can show love. And so the first one, how we show love for each other, is what pastoral care is all about. Pastoral care is all about showing love for, it, for others. And it's important to realise that pastoral care is not my job. Well, I tell a lie, it is my job, but it's not just my job. My, it's the job of everyone in our congregation. We are all the body of Christ. And it's all, of our, our care, it's all of our responsibilities to care for each other. And one of the person, people I, sp I spoke to said, well, this is something that should just happen naturally. We should just care for each other. And if we put a system in place, well, then it, it moves it from being personal to being kind of f focused on system rather than people. But actually, I think that's, that's not right because um, if we all just love each other naturally, that would be fantastic. But it just doesn't happen. And so what happens in reality is that people fall through the cracks uh, and so what we want to do is to, if we can do something that will stop that from happening, then let's do that. And so, again, we want to think about how do we care for each other within the congregations and how do we care for each other across the congregations. And so here, using our diagram, are a couple of things that we're thinking of doing to help us to, to care for each other better. Um, and one is, <laughs> I apologise for GG members because this, in my previous church, we called our Bible study groups growth groups. 
And so it just takes an old person like me time to, to click over. So I, I got rid of most of the GGs, but not this one. Jeringong Groups, that's where it is. Jeringong Groups, call them that, that's fine. Yes, oh, Jeringong, thank, thank you very much. Um, and so, but for our Bible study groups, but obviously our Bible study groups are the key place where we care for each other. That's one of the most important things. And so that's why, one of the reasons why I try and encourage as many people as possible to be in a Bible study group. Because it's there that people can pray for you. It's there that people can make meals for you when you're feeling sick or, or, or whatever it might be. That's the, the, the primary place of care um, in our church. Um, but there are other ways that we can show care. So within congregations, one of the things we want to encourage is for people to start being hospitable. Now, if I just say to you, go and be hospitable, you might go, well, that's a good idea. Um, but then forget it, promptly forget about it because that's what I do. And so maybe you do too. Um, and so... Uh, one of the things we want to do is to uh, have a hospitality Sunday where we encourage people, where across the congregation we organise for people to go to other places for meals. Not because you have to do it that way. In fact, I hope people don't do it that way in some ways. I hope they do it just naturally. But just to make sure that it does happen, we want to ha um, try and have a, a structure to make it happen. Um, again, we want to... Ch the church services are important for our care for one another. One of the things that we're going to be encouraging the welcomes to do is to be taking the role. Now, don't you hate the idea of taking a role for church? It makes you sound like you have to be there, that kind of thing. And if we're taking roles, it just sounds so like the police state. We're looking at, if you're not here, then you're going to be in trouble. But it's actually quite the opposite. It's actually a really loving thing to do, to take a role. Because one of the things that often happens when people are sick or maybe they're feeling down or they don't want to come to church, they don't turn up one week, um, they don't turn up two weeks, and nobody even notices. And so they go, oh... Well, maybe they don't really care if I'm there at all. And so, so easily, you probably know people who've had this situation, um, it's so easy for people to fall through the cracks and just disappear. And suddenly we go, oh, it's been a term, we haven't seen such and such. Uh, and so one of the things that roles can do for us is it helps us to see who isn't there. And so it's not just about taking the role, it's about saying, well, if somebody isn't been there, if, uh, I'm going to pick on Gary because he's there by himself, if Gary hasn't been at church for a couple of weeks, we see it in the role and then... One of the staff members or one of the pastoral care committee can actually ring them up and say, Gary, how are you going? Are you okay? Is there anything we can do? It's a way that we can actually show practical love and help it, uh, help it so people don't disappear without us, without us noticing. And one of the most important people that are in that group are the non-Bible study group members. Because in a Bible study group, everybody there and they know, people, I hope, in your Bible study group, you know how everybody's going and you're praying for each other when they're going through good and bad times. But there are some people in our church who aren't in a Bible study group. Um, I want to encourage them, if you're not in a group, to be part of, to get into a group. Um, but if you're not, that's okay. But one of the things we want to do is to try and work out how to care for our non-Bible study group members. And that's one of the things I'm going to try and encourage our, our pastoral care committee. We're going to, to refocus and re, re, um, launch the pastoral care committee. And one of their roles is going to be to, to have an oversight of the people who aren't in, growth, in Bible study groups. So that they can, uh, they're going to be the ones, they're kind of their surrogate Bible study group, if you like, um, that they will, they will follow up for those who are, who are in need. Um, and also we've got things like meals ministry and serv other service ministries that are happening uh, that many people don't even know about. Like, do people know who runs the meals ministry? Some of you do, some of you don't. Um, uh, and yeah, do people know that Daryl does a whole lot of transport things, organised transport things? Uh, wouldn't it be great if we had a group of people who would be prepared to go and do, you know, the, the Youngs are painting their house at the moment. Wouldn't it be fantastic because you know, Michelle's got a bad back. We could go and do some painting for her. No, she said, no, please not. Um, but a way that we can help each other through practical things. So we're hoping to get a group together uh, to do that more formalised kind of way. Um, and one of the, uh, another important thing about pastoral care is that we actually need to learn how to do it better. Um, and so an important part of this, and in fact all of these sections, is the idea of training. And so one of the things that we have going, coming up already uh, is in May, we've got a thing we're calling Mental Health May, uh, not because we want people to go mental in May, but because we want to help train ourselves, train each other to care for those who are struggling uh, with mental health issues. How can we improve our own mental health and how can we help the health of others? And so we're going to be doing through, through the sermons, but also through our Bible study groups, um, helping to do some, running some training for uh, caring for people with mental health issues. So pastoral care. Now, one of the problems with pastoral care is that, um, you know, one of these people have said to me is that, you know, we've got people in our church who are hurting 
And, you know, we've had a few people who are leaving our church. And so what we really need to do is to make sure we care for each other. And we just, we just forget about everything else and let's just care for each other. And I understand that thinking. But the problem is, of course, when you do that, you stop growing altogether. And you just you become more and more focused on each other. And because in the end, we'll never get rid of all our problems. <laughs> no matter how much we care for each other, we're living in a broken world. And so we'll always have people who are in pain. And so that's why we need to be caring for each other pastorally. But we also mustn't forget to reach out. When Jesus says, love your neighbour, he doesn't just say your Christian neighbour. Love your neighbour. That's all people. And the most loving thing we can do is to share the gospel with people. Now, we show love through caring for our neighbour. I was speaking to someone this morning who, um, who's been baking scones and sharing them with her, going over and speaking and sharing them with their neighbours. How lovely is that? Um, just a really beautiful Christian love. But one of the reasons she does it is to, is to have the opportunity to talk about their faith. She doesn't always get that opportunity, but sometimes she does. So Christian love for, for our neighbours and for our world is important. But uh, we actually need to realise that people are on a journey and so when it comes to the whole idea of outreach and evangelism, people are on a journey. So one of the things we need to do is to, is to do some education and training. So for instance, I want you to think about all the things that we do in our church. Here they are. Um, this, is a, this is a table with all of these. You may not be able to read it there. Hopefully you can read it on your document. Um, this, what this um, table tries to do is tries to show the journey that people make from being complete outsiders maybe antagonistic um, about Christianity, to being people who are committed followers of Jesus. How do people move from there to there? That's a big jump. Like not many people do what Paul did. Um, you know, one day he's persecuting Christians and the next day he's a, an apostle. Not many people do that. Most people take a, it takes a long time. And so as we think about a church, our goal is to help people move along that journey. And so for instance, um, up here we've got the things that, we need to connect with our community. And there are a number of things that we do to connect with our community. One of the things we do is the, um, the markets. We're out there, uh, we, we have stalls, we have pies, pies, and we have uh, Don out there, and we have the cottage clothing. Uh, we have ways where we connect with our community. That's really important because people aren't going to move towards God if, if we don't connect with them. Uh, of course, God can change people, but generally God will work through his people to do this. And so we need to connect, and not just connect with some people, but with all the demographics. And so, again, one of the mistakes that sometimes churches make is say, well, let's do evangelism, and so we'll do an evangelistic event. We'll say, right, everybody come to this thing. But we actually don't think, who, is, who are we hoping will come? Like if we run a big thing with an enormous jumping castle and jump for Jesus kind of thing, how many seniors are going to come to that? Not many, right? If we run a breakfast on the first thing on a Saturday morning, how many teenagers are going to come to that? None, okay? Exactly. So what we've got to do is we've got to think carefully. We've got to be shrewd about the different demographics of people in our, in our area. So when we're trying to reach out to seniors... Something that would be really great for the seniors in our area may not be good for the, um, the young families or the young adults or the teenagers. And so we've actually got to think about all of these different areas, the, from preschool, primary, youth, young adults, young families, adults, seniors. Um, we need to think about the whole, uh, the whole uh, spread of the people who are involved, who are, need to hear the gospel. And so we, as we think about our events, and I was speaking with um, Jim about this, um, about the Fellowship Explorers. That's a great thing for us to do, but it's helpful for us to think, well, where does that fit? What, is, what are we trying to do with the Fellowship Explorers? So I hope when they meet, that one of the things that they do is they go, well, what are we trying to do? Who are we inviting to this? Is this for us to connect with our non-Christian friends? Because that might be a way of, um, a pre-evangelistic thing. It might be something where, we, where we're hoping that our non-Christian friends will come and maybe we'll have a speaker who will do something, just something very light, not too confronting. Uh, is that what we're trying to do? Or are we trying to just connect with each other? Is this a fellowship event? Because we'll have the different aim will have a different purpose. You see what I mean? And, and, we'll, and it will run differently. So the, the aim of this table is to get us to think about why we do what we do and is what we're doing the most effective thing, the most, the most helpful thing. So... In terms of outreach, we'll, we'll skip on from there because there's a lot we can do. We need to think about the journey to faith. We need to think about um, our resources 
And so one of the huge dangers with this, and in fact with this whole document, um, is that we can run our resources dry very, very quickly. And I'm not just talking about our financial resources, I'm talking about you. And so one of the things that uh, is mo uppermost in my mind as we think about all of this is that we need to be careful of who, our, who are our people in our congregation. What powers, what strengths do they have? What gifts do they have? Can we set some people free from some of the things? And so one of the reasons we were trying to bring in the database and changing the rosters around was so that we didn't have to have, we had about five or six, we had six or seven people in our church doing rosters. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could have one person doing rosters and then those other six people are now free to do something else? And so what we need to do is to think carefully and wisely about why we do what we do and how we do it so that we can make sure that we don't use up all the resources that we have, either financial or, or otherwise. Um, we need to think about our events, and our events are not what evangelism is all about. Most evangelism, most people come to faith through a relationship with someone. However, events are important. And so we will, do, we will run particular events. And one of the things I'd love to do next year, if people were willing, is to um, have a week of mission, or a week or two of mission, leading up to Easter, as we, we come up to the celebration of the, the death of our, of our Lord, um, that we can actually uh, have a, a real focus outreach. It's the perfect time for outreach, it seems to me. Um, also, uh, then, then, of course, prayer is, is vital. And, and the final, final thing, uh, prayer... We have to think about our groups. How do our groups? How can our Bible study groups be involved? Um, and our advertising. Uh, somebody spoke to me. Uh, I think it was Val Cuthbertson who said to me, "Oh, we got the whispers the other day, and the United Church and the Catholic Church have got stuff in there, but we haven't. Why is that? Well, it's because we haven't really thought about it. We haven't got a plan to make sure that we do. And so, one of the things we need to do is to get is to get hold of all of those things to make sure that we're getting getting into the whispers." And maybe we might get a couple of people who are really passionate about that, who might see that we could maybe write something regular in there or get, or get our face in there more effectively. And then finally, uh, we need to think about our church, our, our services, which leads us to the next section. I'm going to skip over this one. Yep, yep. That's getting fuzzier. Or is it my eyes? Okay, the, last, the second last thing I want to talk about is our welcoming because our services are a huge part of, of the evangelistic process. People are eventually going to come to church and again, welcoming is one of those things where we actually need to think about it as a process. If you think about it, just pretend for a moment that you're, that you're not a Christian, okay? And you've got it in your mind to go to church. Maybe something's happened, you know, some, maybe a relative has died through COVID or something, and you suddenly think, well, there's something about life. I, I need to find out more. What do you do? What happens to you then? You've never been to church in your life. How do you, where do you go, for instance? Okay, you, if, you, if you live in Jeringong, or hopefully one of the thoughts that we might have is, but we've, we, how do we know, that, how will people know we're here? Now we've got, uh, so there are a few things that we can think about. One of the things we want to do um, is to think about, and let's skip through to here, um, before people even come, how can we be welcoming? How can we show people that we're here? So we want to go through and, and update our website. We want to change our sign and fix the sign so that we've actually got some positive gospel messages coming up on it, uh, but also information about how people can get onto there. So before they even walk in the door, and it also involved us, us training ourselves so that we're ready when they come through the door. When they do come, what do we do? And that's really one of the things that the welcomers do, but it's actually something all of us do. Because again, we are all the church, and we all have a responsibility to welcome. I loved this morning at 10 o'clock service, there was a, a, a couple, couple who were there, friends of uh, Paul and Kim, I think, um, who, who came along. And I was, it was just so exciting to see people just gravitate and, and include them in their circle um, over morning tea, COVID, COVIDly safe um, for the recording. Um, and, but uh, it, was re it was really great to see the congregation welcome. And I think our church is a very welcoming church, but it's really important for us to think about how we can do that even better. So... Uh, we also need to think about when... I can't even see that at all. I'm, I, I know where it is and I can't see it. Um, that as people turn up to the church, how do we welcome them? How do, how do people know where they go for a meeting? Like if they turn up for the 10 o'clock service, where's church? Like if you're not a church person, where do you go? Like the obvious place is the church, isn't it? Um, so we, re, we, need to have, we need to think about that. Where's our signage? Where do the kids go? How do I know? If I'm a visitor... Um, we need to have signs and stuff, those kinds of things ready so that when people go, this is where they're going. And maybe even better, having someone there to welcome them and to, sh and to show them along, along the way. And so 
the whole idea of welcoming is a process from people who are total outsiders to being people who are part of our church. And one of the important parts of welcoming, of course, is to help people to actually be integrated into our church. Uh, it's not just about the first day that they, that they turn up, but the second day and the third day and the fifth day. Um, and how do they connect with people? people the, the, the statistics show that people will leave a church after a month if they haven't formed any relationships. And so it's really important when newcomers come for the church members to, to be hospitable. Come over for a cup of tea or, or, or for lunch or something like that. We're having lunch today. Why don't you come over? Uh, it's really important for people to form relationships. And again, after the, again, the statistics say the next time that people are most likely to leave is after six months, if they haven't found a place, like they haven't formed, a, they haven't been part of a group, or they haven't got some kind of ministry. And so it's important for us to think about: okay, people who've been here for a short amount of time, or maybe a couple of months, how do we involve them in our church so that they actually feel, you know, what I'm not just a visitor anymore; I belong here. And so our goal in welcoming is not just to stand at the door and give them a, a bulletin. That's important, but it's only part of a much larger process that as a church we need to really think about. Uh, Morning tea is another important thing. How do we, morning tea, I don't don't know if you realise that the people on morning tea, you have a vital role to play in welcoming because when you turn up somewhere after the service, one of the best things is to be able to have a really decent cuppa um, and to, be, to, be, to feel like, oh, somebody's given me something, they've gone to the effort. Now we can't do it at the moment, but wouldn't it be great if we could actually walk around and offer food to people? Post-COVID, perhaps. So, we've gone through five, we've gone through 100 miles an hour. There's one last thing, and I don't think you'll be very interested in the last little bit, um, is to do with our buildings. Um, a few things, <laughs> few things to say about our buildings. Um, the first thing to say, and this is really important, is that our buildings are not the church. Now, that's an obvious thing to say, isn't it? Um, the people are the church. The buildings are the buildings in which the church... So that is not a church. That is a building in which church happens. This is a building in which church happens. And so our buildings have been handed down to us and it's our responsibility to hand them on to others in the future who will continue to do gospel ministry. The, the best thing we can do in our, uh, with our buildings is to use them to effectively do ministry, to effectively reach out with the gospel. And so in that document, we're trying to do that and to make sure that these things happen. And so you're, we talked about who's responsible. We talk about um, the care of the property. And you can read those things. I don't need to go through them now. One of the things that's important is about the use by the community. We need to realise that our buildings are not just for us. We want to welcome our, church, uh, our, our community into our buildings because they're not going to come to church on Sunday if they don't feel comfortable to come in during the week. And so it's one of the reasons why it's so great that we have ballet and that kind of thing and um, tap and all those sort of things. It's great that people come into our community and feel welcome. And so when we do developments or changes, it's important to think to keep those things in mind. And so the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is the development. Now, why do we need this? Why do we need to change our buildings? At one level, we don't because the building's not important. It's the people. But we do need it. There are a number of reasons why we need it. The first reason is because we just don't fit Particularly at the 10 o'clock service, um, there's just not enough uh, room for all the people who are wanting to be there, particularly if we grow at all. Uh, We also have um, not enough room and inadequate facilities for parents of children. And so if you're a young mother or father and you've got a small crying child, the last thing you want to do is be in a church or be in here uh, with your child screaming. And at the moment what happens is you have to leave. What we're saying to parents is we don't want you here you go into the church and you can hear it, but you can't see it. You can't see what's going on. We, you're, you're unimportant to us. That's what we're saying by our building at the moment. And so it's important for us to do that for the, for, so that we can show love and welcome to those outside. Um, we also have uh, another uh, couple of problems that the facilities are not suitable for people with disabilities. So if you came here with a wheelchair, you couldn't go to the toilet. You just have to hold it in, uh, which, is not, which is just not adequate. It's not good enough. Um, and also, we have problems with our children's and youth ministries on a Sunday morning. The shed is dangerous, um, especially in high winds, but fortunately the wind never blows in Jeringong, so it's not really a problem. Um, and the other problem we have, of course, is lack of storage. Um, and so we have these two very attractive looking um, uh, containers on the, on the site, which just certainly add a certain je ne sais quoi, don't they? Um, and so we really need to change our buildings 
Um, and what we do, whatever we do, we need to make sure that our buildings are effective for all the different demographics. And so for those of you who are worried, we do not want to, we want to make sure we end up with a site that is suitable for traditional worship. We are not going to turn the, uh, we're not going to gut the church and kind of turn it into a big jumping castle or something. Um, well, that could be fun. Um, we're not, we're not going to do that because it, it is important that we care for those who like that kind of a service. Um, but by the same token, we need to make sure that we have adequate space for our contemporary service, like our 10 o'clock service particularly, but also um, if the evening service were to grow uh, sufficiently. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got um, space for our children and our youth, particularly on Sunday morning. So that during the service, they can, they can go out and if the wind's blowing, they don't all just have to sit in, you know, all cram into one room in the, in the cottage. Um, we need to make sure that we care for all of these. And so we've been thinking for some time that you've been through the process, I know, much more than I have. And so this is where we're at. I'll show you where we're at. Um, this is, after much thought and uh, kind of prayer, this is, this, this is not the final uh, thing, but I just wanted to give you a bit of ballpark picture of the kind of things we're looking at. And what we're, we're, we're thinking we're doing is to do things in stages, because unless God is incredibly generous and gives us um, a huge amount of money, uh, we're not going to be able to do it all at once. So the li likelihood is that we're going we're to have to do things in stages. And the first stage is likely to be here, the existing church. Because at the moment, the existing church is used how many hours a week? One, basically, give or take. Every now and then we've got the midweek service, so it's two. At the moment, it's used for one hour a week. We've got a whole building that's there for, to be used only once, which seems a little bit extravagant to me, doesn't it? And so what we need to do is to think about how can we use that space um, more effectively. And so one of, the, one of the plans is, and we're going to think and talk with people about how we do this, is to actually replace the pews with chairs. Why would you do that? Well, we would do that because then the chairs can be moved uh, to the side, so then you can have a space. You've then got an empty space. We would probably, we would, the likelihood is that we'd carpet the whole church, uh, and then we'd, you can actually get chairs, not like these ones, because these things ones are a little bit uncomfortable. We get comfortable chairs that uh, you can actually link together so they actually look and feel like pews. Not the old wooden, horrible ones, but really comfortable padded pews. Um, which is a bit of a problem because people might fall asleep in the middle of the sermon, but there you go. Um, and so to get to replace those pews with chairs so that on Sunday morning it's still an appropriate place for worship. It'll still look like church and it will still be church, of course, as the people come in. But also it will then make, the make it possible for us to use that more effectively for children's ministry um, or for other ministries. So, and a couple of different ideas of how we could use that even for outreach, that area. Um, and so we could, it then becomes a flexible space that we can use not just for the one hour a week, but actually a number of times during the week. And so that's one of the things, that's the, that's the first stage, and that's really quite achievable very quickly because it would only cost maybe ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 at the most to do all that. So um, that would be something very simple. The second stage would be the place where you're sitting here. And the main issues are space, and so this building is bigger. So it's, you'll notice it's wider, comes out further here um, and, and here. And so it'll fit more people. Um, it's also, this is in the wrong place. So that's, this is one of the things about this diagram I'm going to change. Um, the crying room should probably be here, I think. So to have a place where young mums or dads with their small children can go and be soundproof and they can actually feel like they're part of it with glass, you know, glass windows as opposed to the other kinds of windows um, that help you to see into the church. You'd be able to see, hear everything because be, the, the sound will be piped in there um, and you don't have to go to a different building. It's just there. You can change, change if you need nappy change, that kind of thing, or if the child does. Um, and so to increase the size of that building, but also um, to have an area, because one of the problems we had before COVID was on a Sunday morning, you'd come out of 8 o'clock and the 8 o'clock service would have morning tea in here, which is great, um, except for the people who are playing music or trying to play music at the front and get ready for the next service. So there's things rushing around and there's noise and hubbub and all that kind of thing, which is not very effective really for either group. Um, so one of the things we have down here is a foyer area, which can be blocked off so you can have doors that could concertina out and 
you could close them up, and so morning tea on a, after the 8 o'clock service could be in that room. Obviously, it's nicer if it's outside. That's probably the ideal. Um, but you could have it in that room if it's raining or cold or wet, um, and you could be separated from in here. And so people could be setting up in here without the two interrupting with each other. Um, the other thing that would have is this space here. This is a veranda that will go out onto the grass area. One of the great things about this area is it's so visible. And so um, we can actually have our morning tea out there. Isn't it great? You know that something's happening at the hill, don't you? Because you can see it. Wouldn't it be great for people to see the church and go, wow, something's happening here. That place is alive. There are people there. It's one of the ways we can uh, connect with people before they even come. come. And so trying to make use of this space. People, that person there might need to move their car, but um, that kind of thing. Um, also, we have toilets and a kitchen. So prop, proper um, disabled toilets, um, a kitchen there, and storage. And so that would be the second stage. The third stage is for the children's and youth ministry, um, largely, is this building here. So this is actually removing the cottage. Um, so if anyone, everybody wants a, a cottage going cheap, the, let us know. Um, but to, uh, to replace that building with a building that's not falling down and needs a, need a, um, a roof replaced. Um, and so in this building, you might see in the diagrams, they're closer to you, but there's three interconnected rooms there that, uh, again, have concertina doors. So they could be three separate rooms or they could be one big room. And so one of the things about kids' ministry, particularly on a Sunday morning, is uh, you don't just want one big space. Because as you've ever taught children's ministry, you don't want to have four different classrooms in one room. It's a nightmare. You want to be able to, to lock them, cl close them off so that you can have your own space. You can make a little noise and not disturb other people. You can do that uh, if you've got these kind of doors. Um, oh, actually, while we're talking about the doors, one of the thoughts, my thoughts too, is if we have the concertina doors there, we can actually open this up. So that when we have a, a really big wedding or funeral, you could actually sit all the way back to there and still be part of the church. And so the building would actually then be even more flexible for, for those kind of special occasions. Um, and the other thing that's in this, in this one is uh, there's toilets, there's storage room, there's offices. Um, and this space here is a really important space. At the moment, that space is what? Clothing. Cottage clothing. And that's a really important ministry in our church, I think, because it really does help us to connect um, with our community. Uh, it raises money for our church, but most importantly, it helps us to connect with people. And so we want to make sure that in that, that space, we have a space for that, uh, a dedicated space for it. And so that's kind of where we are with the building. Uh, we, we are still going to, we're still planning about how, how we'll, we'll launch this. And so at the moment, we're not asking you for any money. How about that? Um, but we will be. And so we get you to start thinking and praying and start talking uh, with each other about how, how you might want to be involved. And there will be a, a launch. We're not sure when, are we, David? But we'll get there, hopefully soonish, um, when we actually la launch it and we give you more detailed plans that you can look at, you can pour out over in details, that kind of thing. I've spoken for way too long. I'm sorry. But... I've gone through 21 pages, so you should forgive me. And you guys started late anyway. So um, I want to hand over to you. Do you have any questions? Probably a thousand. Yep, Gina. Well, stage one, stage one is, or if you like 1A, is, is just transforming the church because that's something that we could do really quickly and easily. We don't need DAs. We don't need anything like that. So, so that would be stage one. The next stage would be all of this being replaced. So... The, most likely, this being knocked down and being rebuilt. In the meantime, I should say that we would probably relocate. We'd probably have to relocate maybe into the school, which you may think, oh, what a nightmare that is. But actually, it could be a real blessing. Imagine that. Imagine being able to meet in the school so that the school people knew a church was meeting in their building on a, on a weekend. What an awesome way to connect that we, you know, that we don't do at the moment. And so we could actually we could see it as, a, as an inconvenience or we could see it as an amazing opportunity. And so I, I, I'm not too worried about having to relocate. I think it's actually, it could actually be a really exciting thing for us. So, yeah. Yep. Well, that's a good question. And so, that, so th those kind of details, we can move. Well, so the, the question is about the space um, in between the, the foyer and the church. Uh, we, we, may, we may be able to, to, to move out to there. One of the issues might be the light that comes in. We might need to work out how to make sure the light gets into the, the church building because there's a stained glass window, I believe, down there at the moment. Um, and so we actually thought about the possibility of even opening it up so that the you enter the church that way. Um, but I think the walls preclude us from doing that because of, their, because of the way they're constructed. But, but yeah, so 
I, I'd love to spend all day talking about the building. Um, that's and, and we can if that's what people want to do. But I, if, there, if there are other questions too about other things, because there will be time to think through the building, the plans. Everyone will get plans uh, to think through and mull over. That would be great. But yeah, Cecily and then Les. So the question is, are we going to have an architect involved in that? Of course, yes. Les. So I, I think I think just before just before it goes too too wild, um, I think what Les is talking about is correct me if I'm wrong, Les, but actually moving the the changing the things around from two at the two and three, and maybe doing the cottage area first with um, accommodation up the at the top of the so knocking down the cottage and and putting the this what we see here on the bottom and accommodation on the top, which could then the 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 Income from that could then cover some of the place. So yeah, so that's that's a possibility. We can put it to the building committee. Part of the building committee is here, um, and we'll we'll work through that. And uh, but yeah, so those kind of ideas are great. Please share. Feel free to share those with them. Obviously, not all these ideas we can do at the same time, but um, but we will need to work through those things. But thank you, Liz. Great idea. Yep. Thank you. So the question is about the mental health may whether we have some expert help in that. Uh, and one of the answers to that question is that we've, we have some expert helpers. We, we've got a group of people who have expertise at different levels to do with mental health who are putting together the material that will be being used. Um, for the first study, we're, offer, we're going to be offering to Bible study groups for somebody to come and run that first one from, the pastoral, from this mental health group. Um, the other idea that we've had too is that we, you mentioned the idea of a seminar. Um, we, we've also thought that obviously mental health is not something you just talk about in one month. It's something that we can come back to. And so in many ways this is a, a, a foundational thing. We're, we're talking about how do we care for our own mental health and the mental health of others in our church. So at a very kind of layman's level. Um, and so, layperson's level. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is scope for us to do a seminar like that. And so if you've got ideas, please feel free to share that with myself. Uh, with um, Les, with Michelle, um, and a couple of others. I can't remember it was on my head. Mike, Mike Sloan is also involved, uh, and Connie, of course, um, who is one of our experts um, in in the mental health area. Jim, our pastoral. Well, Graham, as Graham Begbie is our honorary pastoral care worker at present, uh, and so uh, we're working through his. Um, a lot of those things that are in, under his role, he's already doing, and so um, helping to coordinate the pastoral care committee and that kind of thing. And so we may choose at some point in the future to employ a pastoral care worker um, because we see that role expanding. Um, at, the, at the moment, that's, that's where we're at. So that's a good question. But, yeah, so but at the moment, the answer is Graham. Um, but obviously, the Graham works in with the staff. So Graham is with us, comes to us to staff meeting every week. So he's, he's, a, he's a real part, part of our, our staff. And I want to encourage you, uh, often in prayers, sometimes uh, Graham's not here, so I can maybe say it, although he might watch it later. Just ignore this, Graham. Um, that often in prayers people pray for the staff and they pray for Steve and John and Susan. Um, I would encourage people who are praying to pray for, pray for Graham because he's a really important valued part of our staff. He's not a paid member of our staff but really important so um, he probably doesn't want me to say that but, uh, but yeah. So at the moment Graham is doing that role and doing it quite well. Yep. So this is a good question about, the, about prayer meetings and whether they should just be shopping lists. Um, well, let me encourage you to come to the next one because actually I'll tell you what happened. We did yesterday. Um, yesterday morning at 8 o'clock we met and the first thing we did was we opened the Bible together and so we looked at God's Word and uh, we saw from God's Word that God's Word is able to speak to us and encourage us. And so one of the things we did is we actually shared as a group with each other what has God taught us from His Word this week. And so we had a number of people, about five or six people I think it was, um, shared what God had spoken through his word. And we used that um, as, a, as a launch to, to praise. And so when I run a, Bible, a prayer, prayer meeting, um, when we run the prayer meetings, we divide them up. So we don't just say, right, start at 8 o'clock and finish at 9. We always start off by focusing on God. And so we praise praising God or thanking God or confessing to God, that kind of thing. So we focus on God first and then we'll look to God and we'll, say, we'll think about either, we th usually think about our community first um, or, the, or the world and then the world. And so we try and, I try and help people to, to guide through um, our prayers, partly because it's, it's a way that we can learn how to pray. Um, that you, this is a way we can organise our own prayers um, in, our, in our quiet time. So it's kind of educative as well. 
Um, and so, yeah, so, but also uh, in, with the, the prayer, the termly prayer gathering, uh, one of the things that we've done in the past is um, uh, we actually sing, start off by singing. And so, because a lot of our songs are prayers to God. And so, it doesn't, prayer doesn't have to be right, okay, start eight o'clock, we just ask, 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 because that's not what prayer is. The prayer, we do ask God for things. And so, if you want to call that a shopping list, well, yeah, but we, what we're doing is we're actually submitting ourselves, our, our requests to God and saying, God, in the end, it's over to you. You answer them, not my will, but your will be done. And so we come before God. And so part of that shopping list attitude is an attitude that we come with, that I've got, you know, I've got the things I want to get off, but one of the things I want to try and do is to help people to see that we actually start with God and then we think about others and we, you know, we may have a shopping list for others, uh, but not just for ourselves. So does it does it help? Yeah, yeah. Mm, cool. Yeah. Well, yes, that's, that's certainly one way of p- p- people would do that. So some people might, and you know, it's particularly on um, like a market Saturday, people can drop in. That's one of the reasons that um, the cottage clothing and that kind of thing is so helpful. But yes, so we may look to, into the future of having a permanent office, and so there are offices. Um, set into that um, some of the designs that you see there and so having an office could be a good thing but one of the other things that you just reminded me thank you for that Julianne about when people move into the area one of the things that we want to develop is a welcome pack Um, a welcome pack that tells people about our church but also about our town Um, I was speaking to you can you can encourage Marilyn Slane with this Um, she had this idea of making a book with um, all uh, things to do within an hour of Gerringong and so walks you can do and that kind of thing with pictures and that'd be great I'd buy that um anyway so t- tell Marilyn she should do it um sorry Marilyn um but uh but yeah so it'd be great wouldn't it to when somebody moves into the area um for for them to get this welcome pack now I wonder how would they get that who would that come from yeah yeah so then if they don't come to church how else could they get it what? Oh, us. They could get it from us. How do, they, how do you know when somebody moves in? Oh, you see them. Because as you notice, in our church, not everybody lives here. Like people live out there, right? And so one of the things, this is, we're, we're all part of the welcoming here. It's not just a, a, the church should do this. We are the church and we do this. And so one of the things that we should do is keep our eyes open. And if somebody's moving in across the street... You'll see the moving van, um, or you see the building next door, <laughs> perhaps. Um, and <laughs> if you can, you're aware of that. Um, but yeah, so you can, you'll see these people moving in, and how great it would be when they've moved in to drop around and say, you know, here's a plate of biscuits, and here's a, a welcome pack that we have from, our, you know, from our church. It's got information about, you know, where's the doctor, and you know, where do you get your eyes checked, and all that kind of stuff. Wouldn't it be good to have that? But also about our church. And, you know, we meet on Sunday morning and we've got three, we've got three services, those kinds of things. So, yes, that's, a, that's an option and we may end up doing that in the future. Of course, we then need to have somebody staffing it all the time if you've got an office. Um, but in the meantime, one of the most effective things we can do is for all of us to be the office and for all of us to be the uh, proactive in, in connecting with people. And that's what, that's, as we think about outreach, that's part of that process. It's... Oh no! If they're not Anglicans, what do we do? Are they allowed? <laughs> of course, we don't care if they're Anglicans or not. We can welcome them to the city. We can welcome them to the town. And so you welcome them in, and you say, "Here's." They could be Muslim. They could be atheists. They could, whatever. Here's a plate of biscuits. You don't say, "Excuse me, are you Christian? For, are you Anglican first? No. Here's a plate of biscuits. Here's a welcome pack. It tells you about your town. We want to love you. We want to care for you, even though you're not an Anglican um, or whatever. Please do that. So, yeah, so good question because that's uh, – some people think – oh, I wouldn't presume to tell you what to do with the Fellowship Explorers, but that could be something you chose, chose to do. You might say, well, this is going to become one of the ways that we outreach. And so we're going to – invite it might be something that we've advertised but again probably the most effective advertisement is say gary we got this thing happening next thursday you want to come here's an invitation oh yeah you can't well, he's, 
I've got crushes you can borrow. It's okay. It's all right. Um, it's, it's the personal invitation. I told I was going to be on Gary. Um, I, it is a personal invitation. So you may choose to do that, but you, you would then need to think, okay, if we're inviting non-Christians along, what are we going to do? Like going off and, and visiting places is great, but if we're going to have a talk, what's the talk going to be on? Is the talk going to be, folk, be aimed at people who are outsiders? Or is it going to be aimed at, well, this is a nice building. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not no judgment here at all. Like, but what I'm saying is we've got to think about what, if, we invite, if it's aimed at non-Christians, the talk will need to be aimed at non-Christians as well. And so you think, well, who's going to do that and how are we going to do that? Which will be a great thing to do if, if that group decides to do that. And so I want to say to you all this, I'm not telling you what to do here. But I, I want us to think about all the things that we do to, through this lens. Why are we doing what we do? What's the purpose? What's the goal? And so as a group, I hope the Fellowship Explorer organisation group goes, OK, what do we want to do? What is this group for? And once we work that out, OK, now how do we do that? And what's going to be the most effective way of us, for us to do that in fitting, fitting in with the scheme? Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, can I say, I, I'm not aware of receiving a, a call like that, so maybe it didn't come through for some reason. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure either. But um, so that, that's really important. And actually, one of the things that's been highlighted to me a little, a little bit recently is that, that our communication needs to be better from the time. And we, I confess that I'm, I'm not perfect in this regard by any means, and I think part of our care for each other and part of our witness to the world, like, that's, that's terrible, isn't it? Um, if, if she hasn't been resp responded to, and we need to do better at that. And so the communication from myself and, and from John and from the, the wardens and from, from everybody uh, needs to be better. And not just from outsiders, but also about other things. And so that's one of the things that's on my, our agenda to try and improve that. So thank you for bringing that up. And yeah, uh, if, if she's interested, let me know. Yeah, if, you, if you give me your details, I'll, I'll go around. Just let me know. Yeah, thank you for doing it. And if that ever happens, can I say, please talk to us. Straight like, away. sorry? Straight away. Straight away. Yeah, as soon as you can. Um, nicely, okay, because, you know, sometimes things happen uh, and things fall through a crack or whatever. And we, this never our intention. But please share those things, uh, particularly if it's someone, you know, who's feeling like they haven't been communicated with or contacted, um, because we really want to make sure we care for each other properly. And, and con con communication is a vital part of that. So uh, please share those things with us uh, as I do it graciously and knowing that we're, we're frail and, you know, get upset sometimes too. Um, yeah. So thank you for that, Eric. And one of the, you'll notice in that we talked about pastoral care, we talked about um, caring within the congregation but also across the congregations. And so we do want to build a fellowship across the congregations. One of the ways we could do that is through mentoring. One of the ways we would do that is through um, having combined services, um, like the Thanksgiving service at the end of the year, that kind of thing. Um, we could do it by you know, men's conventions. We could do it by lunches, uh, that kind of thing. So we could have a hospitality month. We could have, we could have a hospitality Sunday across the church. So we could have you know, everybody go to Gay, gay Weirs, everybody from the evening service go to Gay Weirs for dinner, that kind of thing. Um, and so we can, we can do those kinds of things. Um, as for today, I, I don't, I'm not sure where the, some of the young families are, but obviously there's, you know, when you've got young kids, it's going to be hard to get out. Um, and there are people I know from the evening service who are working this today, um, that kind of thing. So, uh, and I, that's one of the reasons why we're recording today, so that actually everybody can be involved and can hear about what's going on. Uh, and so these are good ideas, and it's really important for us to really think about. And so maybe one of the ways you might do it, is to perhaps offer yourself as a mentor for somebody who's younger, to get to know somebody from, from the younger service, if we can link people together in that way. So um, these are the kinds of things we are wanting to do, is to connect people across the services. I mean, I think, being realistic, people are more likely to care for people in their own congregation, like that's more natural. Um, but we do need to continue to be connected across the congregations as well, and that's a real blessing. Um, and, you know, we'll do it, sometimes we'll do it really well, sometimes it will be harder. Like in the old days, we'd go on a house party together, you know, we don't do house parties anymore. Uh, maybe we could. Oh, is it, there's not anyone from six o'clock here, is there? Do you know anyone from six o'clock who's here? Well, it's like six o'clock service? For our, yeah, we do, of course we do. Yeah, so, so Joe's here, Mark, Dave, Dave and Michelle. So, yeah, so catch up with these, these younger people after the service, that'd be great. All right. 
So, like, thank you so much for coming today. I'm really, really excited about uh, having you all here. I hope you've caught some idea of the vision of what we're, we're looking to do. Um, but as I said at the beginning, this is God's work and not ours. And so some of these ideas might be great, some of them may be rubbish. Um, but God will do what God will do. And so we need to commit all of these things to God in prayer. So what I'm going to ask you to do is actually to move your, your chairs around. And so we could just have one big open prayer session, but I think that that would just be, be difficult. So what we're going to do is, is maybe get in groups of about five or six people um, and bring these things to God in prayer. Um, it, also, if later, if you have ideas that you haven't shared, you say, I wish I'd said that, then please say that. Come and talk to me or send me an email, probably better, because otherwise I'll forget. So let's pray and I'll call you back in about 13 minutes.